Life are in listen only mode. Hey, hey, hey. Yep. We got the jolly music. Oh my goodness. It's awesome. Ho, ho, ho. We're getting Battle. Indexes versus prefetch. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, we got started. It's late to yeah, yeah. I got a Christmas card uh, from Microsoft and had to reboot. So that's <laughs> story right there. Okay. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to episode number 210 of the DB2 Night Show, where our goal is to educate, inform, and entertain. Today's a really fun show. Uh, I'm your host, Scott Hayes, present founder. DBI Software, IBM Gold Consultant, IBM Champion. Our special guests today include uh, Martin Hubel, who's also an IBM Gold Consultant, IBM Champion, an all-around awesome guy, and Santa Claus. And today we're going to talk about the battle indexes versus prefetch. And uh, how you doing, Martin? I am doing great. Show number two hundred and ten. How did we get? How did this come this far? That's great. We, we've been doing this a long butt time. That's what the story is. Yeah, well, I'm gonna, up to show. Yeah, I'm up to show 94 on the on the Z side. So it's 300 shows between us. That's really amazing. Now the, the night show is a show for the DB2 community. Follow us on Twitter. Mention DB2 Night Show and M Hubel if you have any thoughts to share, and join our LinkedIn group. The disclaimers, uh, we're recording today and all that other stuff. Very quick announcements. And we're going to have some fun today. I call it uh, the memory game. So what I want you to be doing while you're watching today is pay attention to how many Santa Clauses you see. Because I'm going to ask you at the end how many Santa Clauses were in our presentation. And uh, Martin, don't add any to your presentation. Because that'll screw that'll screw up the official answer, right? And then at the end, we're going to ask people how many Santa Clauses they saw, and if they get it right, I just might send them a, a gift card. And we're going to have Martin's Maybe. presentation, and uh, we'll ask our polling questions, and we're going to drink eggnog. I tell you what, this eggnog is delicious. TBI's next webinar is on Friday, the twenty second of February. It seems so far away. Going to drink a lot of eggnog between now and then. Visit our events page and sign up for that. Upcoming shows, 25th of January, DB2 LUW, Favorite Problem Determination Tricks, Pavel Suster. He's with the IBM Canada Toronto Lab. He's like the guy in charge of debugging. He's awesome. I saw him present myself in October. And Klaus Brandt is back on the 22nd of February with his DB2 SQL tuning that he promised uh, last month. Mainframe side, 18th of January. Best design and performance practices with Dave Belke on the 18th. 15th of February, data masking for DB2Z. Ho, ho, ho. Congratulations to Sri Telepali with Winn-Dixie, Jacksonville, Florida. $25 Amazon.com gift certificate winner. Show number 209, the perfect DB2 server with Klaus Brandt. And uh, I just I just yesterday sent out a whole bunch of gift cards. I realized I was delinquent, Martin, and I felt terrible about that. But I did get the gift oh. cards out in time for holiday shopping. That's right. That's a good thing. Just uh, the giggle of the day. I just I, I use this picture on the last show. It's just so cute. This little kid with a little Christmas tree on top of his little car, and it just it just makes me feel jolly and happy. Ho ho ho! And now it's time for Martin's awesome presentation. Ready, Martin? All right. Thank you. The I am. All right. Uh, show my screen. And this is the mystery of which screen is it showing right now? It's I, always, it's always I see a tent and a landscape. All right, yeah, that's that's that other screen. Let me see if I, what happens when I click this slideshow thing. And it goes on to the other screen. I love it. I love it. Yes. There we go. So actually what I want to do, though, is I had my, I had my index slides all behind that. 
and I'm going to snag those and put them over here. So I have a roadmap of where I'm going to talk today. Isn't that a good idea? Every now and then I find I find that I'm full of good ideas. You know, when you, when you get to be our age, you just need little, little reminders. Yes, I have uh, what you call sometimers disease. <laughs> and they say that as you get older, your brain fills up with more things such that sometimes you need a reorg, or, and, and that's why access uh, times can be slower than, than wanted. Right on. And, uh, that's the that's story, and I'm sticking with it, man. Um, this is my presentation from uh, I dug in Malta. We had a, a good time in Malta. The best thing about uh, it was that the weather was a constant uh, 70 degrees or 20 degrees Celsius uh, all week. Uh, the evenings were nice. You didn't need a jacket. The days were pleasantly, uh, well, they were really nice. And uh, I didn't have to think of leaves off trees and that sort of thing. And, and uh, weather cooling down into the 40s or uh, single digits here in Toronto if you're a Celsius fan. So I've been uh, talking about indexes and prefetch for golly, how long? Uh, 20 years? And uh, I keep trying to come up with another way of saying it to try to uh, clarify my message. And I, I think I'm a little closer, that I'm a lot closer to this time. So I, I put this presentation together and we're going to and we're going to have some fun. And, no, uh, after 20 years, it just might sink in for some people, huh? Well, you, you always, uh, I had a really nice compliment in uh, Malta, a, a Finnish uh, friend and customer of mine uh, came up at the end of my presentation and says, I've heard you speak for 15 years. And he says, every time I hear you speak, I always learn something new. And I thought that's about the nicest thing I'd ever heard anyone say to me about my presentations. Well, that's awesome. So, teach us, teach us. Yes, yes. So. Today, I want to talk about indexes versus prefetch because everybody sets out to design these indexes. And, and yes, as uh, the standing joke goes, I've made more money removing indexes because people put on bad indexes. So I managed to put uh, two of my three children through college by removing indexes from tables. And people uh, always put on indexes in the hope that they're going to be used. And uh, then they're disappointed. And uh, uh, I want, don't want to say they're rewarded with prefetch, but that seems to be the next alternative. Alternative. They're now standing at table and they're seeing prefetch go on. Um, in terms of designing indexes, uh, we want to talk about some key things to remember there. Yes, I could talk and uh, do five presentations on indexes alone, but we're, we're going to just touch on the, the high points as it were, and then we'll talk about prefetch. And if you do end up with prefetch, what's the ways you can do to make prefetch uh, work a lot better and have less of an impact on your workloads? talk about other things, and then we'll compare prefetch to non-clustered index and who wins. So with that, we'll uh, carry on and, and talk about some things. And unlike uh, uh, Scott today with Santa Clauses, you'll see uh, the uh, ZOS co-host show up from time on my slides. I don't count them all, but uh, he's too cute not to put on the slides. And I'm sure at some point during my presentation, he'll be in uh, scratching and banging my leg, demanding a, another liver treat. He's always wanting to do that, so uh, he shows up from time to time here. So, um, so let's talk, get into the questions of why uh, why didn't DB2 use my index? Well, you know, many index uh, index use can be simple. You can looking at primary keys, and that's a uh, column equals being your primary key, which means you're either going to get one row back or you're not if that key is not there. And, and matching indexes to SQL is generally fairly straightforward, and people see how to do that. But other indexes might not be helpful. You end up with a situation where there's uh, the index columns do not match the predicates in a where clause. The order of the index columns is not ideal. And there's complex with uh, SQL with many range predicates. And uh, you know, one of the things that I constantly see when I go into customers is that they, they know they need an index on date or time. And uh, that column generally, because it's going to be a range on date or time, it needs to go further down the index and in being the first column. Uh, you know, if you're looking at the phone, uh, uh, a name in a, uh, an old style phone book made of paper, and you say, well, I know his first name is Jerry. I don't know how to spell his last name. And I think it starts with some letter, first five letters of the alphabet. That's going to be a big scan to try to find that. 
and that's basically what people are doing if they uh, put a, a date range at the beginning of an index. I'm trying to trying to get people not to do that is something that, that happens early on. And the bottom line on it is that some indexes simply do not save enough I/O to be considered useful by DB2. So in in response to that, DB2 will do a scan, and in which case it's it's now doing prefetch. And so looking at cost. Uh, there are a whole bunch of different access paths generally for any query. DB2 chooses the path with the lowest cost based on the I.O. for both data index indexes and the CPU for sorts and other CPU operations. Um, and uh, in, in there as well, that with DB2 LUW and in, in the, uh, the cost computation is the speed of your CPU. And uh, there's a trick, uh, I'm, I know Scott knows this one, uh, where if you upgrade the speed of your CPU, you can have DB2 recalculate the speed of your CPU simply by uh, changing that uh, the value for the CPU speed to minus one, which means that the, at the first opportunity, DB2 will recalculate that value and you'll get the new speed. Now, to compare indexes to prefetch, yes, indexes are, let's say, they're generally good and prefetch is generally bad. Uh, so we like to see indexes be used. And people, whenever I've uh, gone into so many tuning assignments, we say, well, I guess you need to add more indexes. And in some cases, yes, we do. We have various ways of doing that. We'll talk about the design advisor and a few things like that. It's always a popular topic at iDug, you, uh, particularly on ZOS. If you, have a, uh, you want to get a full room of people, come up with a catchy title, talk about indexes, you'll have 200 people in the room. That's pretty easy to do these. Uh, it's always been that way for the last uh, 35 years of uh, DB2 presentations that I've gone to. On the other hand, scans and prefetch are not what we want, so we've got to go through and and uh, we and we also look at uh, that as sometimes being a, fail, a failure on having the right index or not enough indexes, but we also want to tune uh, our prefetch to make sure it operates as well as possible. So if I have a, a poorly uh, tuned database for doing prefetch in terms of the size of prefetch I'm using and that sort of thing and the size of buffer pools. Um, I can make prefetch even worse, but if I want to do a fair comparison, I want to have good prefetch against being compared against good indexes so I know where the cutoff is. And so what we need to do is talk about optimal indexes versus good prefetching capabilities. So changing indexes, um, uh, people like to, uh, People get really comfortable adding indexes, and some people get really comfortable, but uh, I mean, really comfortable. Uh, what's the highest number of indexes you've seen on a table, Scott? Oh, I had, probably around 24, a couple of dozen. It's pretty really? crazy. Oh, I had a guy in the Czech Republic send me this design he did, and uh, after an IDUG conference about 10 years ago, I think it was in Vienna, whenever the last time we were there. And uh, this guy had a 400 million row table, and it had 38 indexes on it. Oh, good golly. Yeah. And uh, I had a, um, an orders table uh, at one customer uh, about 15 years ago, and uh, I took all of the SQL, 2,000 SQL statements roughly, and put it through the design advisor. And this thing recommended... Uh, with no compression of the workload, it came up with 119 indexes that wanted me to put on an orders, ta orders table. We already had uh, somewhere around 15, but uh, it was a read-only table, basically. There was only, uh, you know, very few updates per day. But uh, but having done that, you know, you look at it and you say, none of these, some of these indexes are not being used. Of course, we've got the last used column, which came out in DB297 fixed pack 2, and if that, you can look at that, and if you've been running a production application for you know some period of time, six months or more, or years or more, if you see an 01, uh, an 01, 01, 001 date in there, that means that it, that index has never been used for retrieval. So uh, it's a that's an easy way to get rid of an index. The other thing we'll be talking about in this presentation is cardinality, and what's the minimum cardinality you need for an index to be usable. But when you talk to these people who've added a lot of indexes and you talk about removing indexes, uh, I, these are the things I hear. Well, that index might not be helping now, but it might help in the future. Yeah, yeah. Like, uh, like as if uh, we just leave it there long enough, sometime uh, DB2 is going to choose to use it. 
uh, the other one uh, I like is when a vendor, you talk to a vendor, and uh, one of them that, that uh, has three letters in their name, I, I can't think of it right offhand. Um, the vendors tell me they know what they're doing. Yeah, so we, we're going to believe them, right? And, no, they uh, don't. Uh, vendors are clueless. <laughs> And then we also had uh, a good friend of mine uh, uh, stated that uh, there are elephants, which are these ginormous queries that, that need fixing. And yeah, they only run a couple times a day, but they use uh, you know, seconds or minutes of CPU time. We want to fix those. Those are the elephants. And if you get stepped on by an elephant, you kind of know it, and it hurts, and it could kill you. And on the other side, we got mosquitoes. And I was in a meeting one time, and the project leader had heard about elephants and mosquitoes, so he kept saying it over and over again. And uh, golly, it was special. But uh, so, having said that, we've we've got these people that are, are un, un, uh, unwilling to remove indexes, and these indexes help with retrieval, but they slow down data change processes. So, what we're interested in doing uh, is uh, getting rid of those indexes to slow up uh, in, or, or, or speed up rather inserts, updates, and deletes. And on behalf of my children, I'd like to say in writing, I thank them all because they've kept me gainfully employed for a very long time. So I spend time when I go into customers and uh, I, I'd like to have them remove indexes and when they're reluctant, I'm always uh, interested when they say, well, Martin said to remove this. Now, I'm not taking any credit if it doesn't work, right? It's we're all gonna blame him. So I get that a lot, but uh, at the end, uh, they're happy, so. Uh, Getting, getting rid of poor indexes can speed up applications by a lot. I came up with some uh, index tune-up guidelines. I've been talking about these for years, so, and I'm not gonna spend a lot of time going through them. Where I am gonna uh, spend my time is on clustering because that's the one that seems to get people the most. And, uh, but uh, you can't really go around changing the primary index without understanding how that affects your logical design. If I add, a, add or remove a column from a primary index, particularly people want to add columns to it, uh, you, you can do that uh, these days if you use the include column, or you can essentially have data values in an index that, that are not used for retrieval, and that'll keep your primary index in, in uh, working the way it should. Um, I also have people that love index only access. When I go into a customer and I see 22 columns in an index and it's matching, it's matching on only three columns, uh, they like to tell me about index only access and how these columns might help later. Uh, sometimes th things are just out of order, you know, and there was one place where that's what, it was a very common thing. They only matched on three columns. Um, the fourth column was never specified or only specified in 5% uh, of their queries. So by, uh, Getting rid of that column index, uh, the number of index columns used uh, improved uh, greatly and performance got better. Uh, the next thing is looking at clustering index. It seems that people don't understand that as much as we talk about it. And we'll talk more about uh, that in the, in the next slides. Removing redundant indexes, removing unnecessary index columns, adding columns and adding indexes. Yes, these are all things that need to be done. So the clustering choice, though, is often not intentionally made. But by that, I mean that the reason I want to use a clustering index is to reduce the amount of I.O. that goes on. Uh, when, uh, if you don't make the change intentionally, you are uh, then often using the first index defined on the table, like the primary key. And having a cluster, clustered primary index is often not the best choice, almost always not the best choice. Let me say it that way. Putting the index on the most time sensitive process is the best thing to do. And the one on this slide which really should stick out to people is the valuable index with a lower cardinality. Not necessarily extremely low cardinalities, but the one that would be useful if it was clustered versus not clustered. And range predicates come into it, avoiding sorts, yes, and uniformly spreading indexes. That's probably the worst idea to use a uh, clustering index for, there are other options available to you if you really feel you need to do that. Uh, one of the newest ones that people don't talk enough about is insert time cluster tables, which are like MDCs, where you're just throwing data into cells within a, an MDC-like table in, in time sequence. And that's very useful if you're uh, doing things like an audit trail where you just want to save data but in time sequence. Okay, looking at clustering order, 
Uh, the top index is clustered, the bottom index is not, which means the index keys are always in order, but when I go to a, a cluster and index, uh, all of the keys, uh, the data in the data pages is in the same order of, uh, as the index, which means that when I read uh, the index keys and I'm using these in sequence, I'm finding more data on uh, fewer data pages when I use a, a clustered index. In fact, when uh, DB2 does its calculations, what it's looking at is how many pages do I have to read if I'm using a clustered index? On the other side, if I'm using a, an unclustered index or a non-clustered index, DB2 has to say for a given index key, how many rows will I have to read? Assuming that each row is on a different page. Yes, there are variations of that, and I've never seen an index that is completely unclustered. Uh, but uh, it does mean that more I.O. will go on with a non-clustered index. So what I want to do is to choose the most time-sensitive process with low cardinalities, meaning that the, the, uh, the data rows on, on, in the table are stored in the order of my clustered index. That's a uh, relatively, I think that's about the best way as I can say that today. Um, come back next year, I might have a better way of explaining it. Uh, so here's some cluster facts. Um, and I basically said that right now, the non-clustered index is one row, uh, one I.O. per row in the worst case. Clustered index computes the rows per page, compute the uh, rows per prefetch operation, and the clustered indexes are normally the best choice you have for a multi-row answer set happening from a, low, uh, a lower cardinality uh, answer set. So the low cardinality columns may help with, re with data retrieval, if the index is skewed, and uh, the other viable option is multidimensional clustering tables as well. Here's a good example I have uh, going back many, many years, but it still holds true. I tried to put little arrows in to explain things. Uh, we had a t uh, This table was just relatively new, but it was already starting to show performance problems. We had 400,000 rows in the table prefetch size of 32 based on, on the, the age of this, the number of pages used, and the row size. Uh, we ended up with a calculation of six rows per page here uh, based on 400,000 rows on 65,000 pages with a very long row size. Looking at this a little closer, we notice that four indexes on the table. This is a PeopleSoft application at the time. The, the way they wanted to process the data was in the order of this uh, uh, index here with an A in the third position here. There's 200 distinct values on a 400,000 row table. Now, by doing the calculation here of the prefetches on the entire table, we end up with roughly uh, 65,000 pages divided by a prefetch quantity of 32 to give us 2,000 rows, or 2,000 prefetches rather. If we uh, look at the uh, number of uh, pages with clustered keys, if we put all of those pages together, we end up with 33 pages. And we look at the prefetches for clustered rows, gets down to only having to read 11, or, or reading uh, 11 prefetch operations to read the 2,000 rows we're after. If we're not doing that, and we're going through this index, we're basically having to read so many rows that the prefetch was a better choice. By moving the index from uh, the default of the uh, primary key, moving it to the other index, we uh, improved the per performance of this batch process in four hours to 45 minutes, and we made our batch window. These are the things that we, we've got to look at and, and see whether or not uh, uh, they help. You can uh, otherwise the you know this is a, a batch process where where when you, if you don't make your batch window, yes, people are, are sitting on their hands when they come into work in the morning. And that continues to be a, a problem for people. Here's another example of uh, uh, a very small company. This, uh, by the way, is AOL still in business, Scott? I think they, they are. Were, they were uh, purchased by somebody. The uh, domain still exists. Again. A lot of people still have AOL email addresses. It's like yeah, Verizon yeah. bought Yahoo, but I still have a Yahoo email. Yeah, I do too. I I used to have a CompuServe email, if you remember those days. It's going back a long time. But um, uh, 
uh, there was a company that was doing uh, technical analysis of stock prices for AOL, and uh, they had a two-column uh, index on there. They had stock symbols and they had dates, uh, and the, the question become which column should be first in the symbol, and somebody had gone to an IBM presentation, and they said, well, you know, we keep a 10-year history, so we've got 3,650 uh, dates or so in uh, when we only have 300 stock symbols we're choosing. So they had set up the index this way based on putting the highest cardinality first in an index. But uh, the problem with this is when you're retrieving only a single stock symbol, the, the date is spec specified in a range, so it puts the ordering off. And simply by switching the order of that, um, putting the stock symbol first, even though the cardinality is lower, but you could always specifying it a st single stock symbol at a time, used with an equal predicate, so the index becomes much more valuable. Equal predicates rule. Equal predicates always rule. And the bottom line, too, is date should never be first in an index. Uh, I, I, and by the way, if you're in a, a, um, uh, an analytics or data warehousing situation, uh, every Every index or every uh, table you have probably has a date somewhere on a fact table. So you never want that date to be the first column. Let's just emphasize that point. Wow! Yeah, oh, thank you. And now I feel better. And uh, I must say I've played eight uh, Christmas concerts this year. I'm, uh, I'm fully Christmas musicized. Oh, that's excellent. Do you have yeah, the trombone I, handy? Maybe you can play us some oh, I, music later. I, I, I'm pleased to inform you it's upstairs. It's out <laughs> of the case, but it's, uh, it's upstairs. I, uh, I did orchestra stuff. I, I played for the Toronto Paramedics uh, uh, Children's Christmas Party last Sunday. I played at a, a, a uh, special needs uh, children's hospital last night. Yeah, there's been all sorts of community service going on. I'll tell you that. Very good, Martin. Yeah. All right, uh, tuning vendor indexes. This is kind of fun. Uh, uh, our indexes are well designed. Our indexes only return one row. That's kind of my favorite uh, thing ever. I went back to my uh, SAP customer and I looked at the the uh, problem queries that we were having to tune. And uh, in fairness to the vendor, um, these were additional um, uh, uh, pieces of code we had written for reports that required more than just one row coming back, but they certainly, we had uh, 300 queries that were uh, returned multiple rows. And the other one is, you might be in big trouble for that index if you dropped it now when you need it a year from now. So let's burn CPU cycles for an entire year. And uh, this gets, gets back to the old thing, it's better to apologize later and do the right thing now than to uh, uh, burn cycles for a year waiting for an index to be used. Uh, conversely, I actually had one place where ind independent tuners can add value for customers. I had a person at PeopleSoft back before Oracle bought them actually say that in a room when I was present, and it made me feel good. Um, but the things that come up is uh, most vendor indexes are well designed for delivered code. A few customers implement all search fields, so the indexes on those search fields can be removed and almost every customer has customized functionality. And how long does it take to add an index back if you've deleted it or add an index? It's a very easy thing to do. It doesn't require functional testing of the application. So one of the things I emphasize with my customers is spending time to uh, uh, look at what indexes can be added to match the SQL they have. If I have to tell a customer that the SQL is terrible and we need to change SQL because it's very poorly written, I realize I'm asking them uh, something that could take, if they started working on it right away, it could take four to four weeks to eight weeks to go through change management and uh, testing before it would be implemented. But I can uh, change anything but the primary index very easily and see whether or not it helps. And actually, I think that's the basis of Brother Panther and the DBI tuning efforts, isn't it, Scott? Uh, yes. Yeah. I'm waking you up from time to time. There. Sorry about that. Well, I'm getting deep. It is the, gonna... I'm getting deep into the agnostic here. Oh yeah, I've got a, I've got a nice bottle of uh, malt whiskey, a uh, single malt whiskey. Uh, a good friend of mine brought me from Scotland over to. Uh, it may be pay twenty five dollars from a, my 
uh, bag check when I had carry on luggage because I certainly didn't want to miss out on that bottle of uh, hooch. That's good stuff. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And uh, comments on index from vendor applications. Uh, vendors try for uniformity. Uh, they don't want to design for Oracle, then design for DB2. The definition of clustering uh, in DB2 is different than Oracle. There used to be a kind of a parent-child thing going on in Oracle where they would uh, kind of try to get the, the related keys together on uh, nearby as opposed to what DB2 do, does, which is based on data values. Uh, they don't use MDC tables, although uh, I will say that SAP is starting to learn about MDC and ITC tables, the insert time clustering for certain uh, for certain of their uh, 73,000 tables. Um, there's no include columns in delivered indexes, so that's something where I've gone in uh, in various parts of SAP, for example, on some of their temporary tables. They had a seven-column primary key with only two data columns. I added those columns in, and uh, we uh, noticed that performance got a lot faster. Uh, but uh, working with application vendors on SAP, in, uh, in six years of working with SAP, we added uh, 200 indexes, a lot of that to custom code. Uh, the, the SAP indexes themselves are really good, and a few tables ended up with eight indexes, the rest uh, fewer than that. Some down as uh, low as one or two, uh, many in the uh, three to five index range. Another uh, uh, great thing is the design advisor tool. This is a great and free part of DB2. The main problem with it is when people find a bad query, they uh, like to play whack-a-mole, which is the thing where you find the worst query, you tune that, and then you move on to the next worst query, and you tune that, and you add an index for every single query. Uh, single um, single uh, 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 query use of indexes. Uh, does lead to a lot of indexes, and so it's something I'm trying to find a way around, but the, the best step I've seen in doing this was uh, uh, Scott Hayes' presentation from 2016, presents, uh, presentation C03 hmm. and in there. Scott has done an awful lot of things on index addition and subtraction, and it's the best I've seen anywhere. Oh. So there, there's, a, there's a plug you can uh, you reach around and hear your... Give yourself a pat on the back. I'm I'm breaking my arm right now. Yeah, Ow. yeah. But don't spill the egg on in the process. Yeah, we call that advanced index benefit analysis. And, yeah, and yeah. one of the ladies that presented for DBI, uh, Josie St. Hilaire at TMW Systems, she emailed me. She said the advisor told her to add 37 indexes. And she said, no. I'm not going to do that. And then she did the advanced index benefit analysis. And most of the indexes she could tell from the get-go were junk. And so she yeah. did the advanced analysis. It turns out only one of the 37 recommended by the advisor was helpful. Um, Amazing. What's the, correct, what's the correct term for that? I think the words that come to my mind is yikes. <laughs> No, just remember, IBM, yeah. it's an acronym for International Business Machines, which helps us remember that IBM is in the business of selling machines. <laughs> yeah. well, IBM has uh, been a very good uh, basis of my 40-year uh, uh, career. Yes, sir. Uh, Working, working in this stuff, and I, I, I thank them every day for the, the uh, sage advice they give me and the, the help they give me when I need it. That's right. They make a mighty fine uh, database. They certainly do. It's been a, it's been quite a ride. I had to do all sorts of other things before DB2 came out. i have been working for uh, 10 years prior to uh, DB2 coming on the scene in my neck of the woods. So, yeah, it's been quite a ride. Okay, let's move along. Uh, by the way, do you need a commercial break today? Uh, I'll, t I'll, t I'll take a micro short one because that's when we ask our polling questions too. Are you ready to sip on your special coffee? I am. All right, then it's uh, commercial time. Let's see, make presenter. Show my screen. So we've had we've had Martin on. He's doing a fine job in his great presentation. Move your mouse. It's time for some polling questions. And make sure our audience is awake. 
And let's see, I haven't. Go to meeting is not responding. Close the program, wait for the program to respond. I think we'll pick that option. <laughs> Good golly. golly. What golly. a day. What a day. It's always something. Can I actually make you, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm an organizer. Could I make you? Oh, there you go. You're up. I, I'm seeing, I, I'm seeing polling questions now. I got it going. <laughs> Yay. What versions of DB2 are you running today? Our esteemed, beautiful audience. Uh, we're looking for 80% or 30 seconds, whatever comes first. Catch a few more votes from our good looking holiday festive audience. Going once, going twice. Closing the poll, sharing the results. 10 fives the winner, 68%, 63% version 11, 26%, 10 1 and 9 7. Giddy up, move along. Well, that's, you, you gave him a chance to uh, respond to more than one there. That's true. Yeah. Now, now, this one's the really interesting one that I've been tracking. What operating systems are you using for DB2? Sweet. And, and AIX always used to be the sure winner, usually by a substantial margin. And then lately, I'm watching that x86 Linux has even beat AIX a couple of times. Holy so schmoly. It's, yeah, it's, uh, people are falling in love with that Linux and running a DB2 on the Linux. Mm -hmm. And let's catch a couple more votes. Please contribute, people. This is, this is scientific analysis of the DB2 world. I need your participation. Going once, going twice. Closing the poll, sharing the results. Well, today it's 61% AIX, 33% Windows, 50% x86 Linux, and we got some Z Linux today. That's cool. Okay, next. This is this is probably the most important polling question today. I will be looking for 90% audience participation. Have you been naughty or nice? This because. We, we've got a direct line to Santa Claus. And, um, we're gonna we're gonna do some reporting on on this. Now, be honest in your self evaluations. Fifty seven percent have voted. Sixty percent. Keep clicking the buttons over there, folks. What do you think this is going to look like in the final analysis, Martin? Well, I'm thinking, uh, well, I'm actually watching the poll here. So I, I, if I said anything, I'd just be reporting the results early. So I think we're, but people normally, uh, it normally goes 50-50. What do you think? I think we're going to see a bell curve. Okay, yeah. nobody else is voting. So there's a small portion of our audience that has gone for coffee or fallen asleep. Closing the poll, sharing the results. 10% very naughty, 15% very nice, 15% a little bit nice, 10% a little bit naughty, and then 45% both. So there we go, human nature. That looks, that looks like a bell curve to me. That's a beautiful bell. Yeah. Are you using DB2 in that fluffy cloud thing? AWS cloud, another cloud, not yet. Thinking about it in the future. No way, no how, not for us. Mm. You know, for all the for all the hoopla about cloud, this has been another interesting trend to watch. Mm -hmm. Okay, going once, going twice, closing the polls, sharing the result. Got some customers uh, considering it for backups, even putting backups in the cloud. Yeah, get them off back, like backups, quickly. development maybe with yeah. non, non mm -hmm. production data. You know, mm -hmm. there's, there's some merit in some circumstances. Mm -hmm. Most notably, 
5% AWS, 5% another. I wonder what those clouds are, if anybody wants to share the uh, question. 0% IBM cloud. So that's... Uh, Yikes. I, I, you know, I think IBM should stick with the on-premises stuff, frankly. But that's just my opinion. on What do I know? Okay. Are you using DB2 peer scale? This has been a fun trend to watch. DB2 version 11 made peer scale a lot easier to use and implement. It's still not easy, but it's easier than what it was. And uh, seeing a lot of people starting to adopt it for the high availability mm -hmm. characteristics. You know, if one machine dies, the other one's you know still carrying the load. Right. But, uh... I think on the mainframe, it uh, worked out to about 10% of customers ended up being data sharing, which is essentially pure scale. Right. right. I think that probably be, probably be the target for pure scale. It would be about 10%. 6% of today's audience is doing the pure thing. 28% mm -hmm. not yet, but evaluating in 67%, two thirds say, nope, no need. That's not how we use DB2. Okay, I think that's it for now. That's that's it. Okay. All righty. Commercial break, and it's going to be super short because I'm drinking eggnog. Just want to point out that for six years now, six years, just added 2019, DBI has been named by database trends and applications as a trend setting product or top 100 trend setting products 2014 15 16 17 18 19 six years in a row and where do we see these accolades and recognition for other tools can't say that i've seen any and that then takes me back to martin all right Make martin the presenter again it's waiting for that thing to show up uh, there I hope you go. You're, seeing, you're back to seeing the last slide, I hope. Yes, sir. Good. Well, let's move along and see if we can show some more slides here. So let's, uh, we talked about indexes. That's why we uh, stopped there. Now we're going to talk about prefetch. And um, to understand how prefetch works, we have to talk about I.O. and buffer pools. And the main thing to keep in mind with this is there are various algorithms, there are various pieces of code that do all of these wonderful things in buffer pools for us. But when we look at prefetch and, and uh, why it's being used, it's typically because DB2 looks upon prefetch as being cheaper than using an index. And the idea here is it's an, a distribution issue is the, the main thing I, I'd like to, get, to keep in mind as we go through this. This is a famous picture uh, it's with my very crappy looking disk drives. Maybe I should be able to uh, take that away from something that looks rotatable and uh, make them square boxes. For SSDs, uh, my, dra my drawing would therefore improve, but it's rather interesting how, I, uh, um, uh, how the old boxes still show up and people like to use them. The main thing we talk about with, uh, and this is uh, in writing on the next page, and I've got Charlie and banging my leg now for cookies. Such a cute little guy. Insistent. Um, is your application asks for data, and that's by uh, uh, doing select statements. And you, you can uh, you can have uh, single rows come in. You can also have uh, uh, rows fetched via cursors and this sort of thing. And those requests for data are logical I/O. What DB2 chooses to do with your your uh, uh, with your request is to either, uh, first of all, to get the data from the buffer pool. And if, if the data is in the buffer pool, it quickly sends the data back. No, no, no harm, no foul. Very easy. If the data is not in the buffer pool, it has to do physical I.O. to go read the data from the, the external storage device, whether it's a rotating disk or whether it's an, an SSD. There are additional instructions required to go to the disk drive and to bring those rows in. That, uh, SSDs are much faster, but they, as I say, there's still instructions and delays involved with getting that data in. So uh, that's tracked as a statistic called rows red. So uh, we, 
we have rows selected or fetched and rows read. And comparing those gives you an idea of how efficient your buffer pools are in terms of returning data to your application. I can tune the buffer pools. I can make them. I can have multiples of them. I can make them very large. I can uh, uh, these days. Uh, uh, my record right now for any customer I've worked with in terms of the amount of hardware they bought with IBM. This is a standing five-year record where somebody was moving off mainframe to DB2 and AIX. Uh, uh, IBM wanted to sell them as much hardware to, as possible to ensure their success. So yes, they took a 32 gigabyte mainframe and bought 1.5 terabytes of memory for their AIX machine. Uh, I'm looking, I've recently had an opportunity to see their IO statistics and nothing is under 99%. That was, uh, that's really nice to see. However, if you're not so rich on uh, to have that much memory, you can, uh, if you <laughs> It had to come, and actually, that's probably the, the most appropriate use of that sound ever. Uh, I was asked, I was asked three times on my first visit to them in the first week whether or not that 1.5 terabytes of memory would be enough. And uh, on the third time, after hemming and hawing a little bit, I finally said, "Well, I, I've heard of people using 256 uh, gigabytes of memory and saying that's a big machine." So. You've won the record, and uh, I don't think you need to buy any more. I probably disappointed someone, but uh, that seemed to be the case. That was the know, IBM hardware salesman that you disappointed. It was in December. It was uh, the end of the year was coming up, and there was a, a an opportunity to. Uh, I remember we bought some things in December one year to help our uh, back in the days of system engineers. We bought additional stuff in December to help them win a bicycle. They were, had a contest. You could get a bicycle if we uh, bought more stuff. And the CIO was such a, a big blue customer. He did just that. It was kind of nice. That was, that was a nice thing to do. But, but that right. was 30, that was 30 years ago. We don't do that anymore. But if you make your buffer pools too big and you affect the OS, you can uh, have uh, activity going to the page files. So essentially, you'd read your data in from this disk and put the data out to, uh, on this disk. And that's bad. I don't see paging go on very much, but every now and then when you're starting with a new customer, it doesn't hurt to look and understand that. So let's move along. Uh, types of physical I.O. we have. And these are the things we, we really going to talk about. Random or synchronous I.O. Random I.O. It means an available index was used. Random I.O. or synchronous I.O. is considered to be good and the thing you want. If for some reason you don't have the ability to use an index or you're going through an index in, in uh, clustering order, you can have prefetch kick, kick in. This is really good. Uh, this can be uh, what it's really doing for you is making the worst case much better. Instead of reading one row at a time or one page at a time, it's now able to read multiple pages. The, the smallest size you normally see for prefetch is 32 these days. 64 or 128 can often be used. And this is a way of making the worst case better. So in terms of prefetch uh, or asynchronous I.O. or sequential I.O., we have pure sequential list and we have smart data and index prefetching, which is, includes the dynamic prefetching and the ability to read ahead in a, in a much more uh, intelligent manner. And they've improved that again in DB2.10.1, so life is good. If, if you do have prefetching, IBM looked, at, looked uh, down at that technology and found other ways to use it with the list prefetching, which essentially is like skip sequential processing and uh, this, the uh, the uh, idea of turning it off and on as needed based on sequential patterns and data. So that's really good. Um, we have a prefetch quantity which is adjustable in DB2 for LUW. You can make it some number, which you can compute, or you can just let uh, DB2 do it. The automatic actually seems to work as well as anything. Uh, I used to like to set it to a number because then I knew what the number was. The automatic number, unfortunately, I have not found a metric anywhere which tells me the actual prefetch quantity being used, but it seems to work very well. So I'm, I, at this point, I've started to trust IBM on that one. Table prefetch happens to no indexes to support the SQL, or the indexes do not reduce the cost to be cheaper than using prefetch. Uh, and also, in cases where you need a large number of rows returned, possibly a range of rows. Index uh, prefetch happens when you're scanning indexes with low cardinalities. 
uh, or there's some mismatch between the SQL and the index columns. Right so on. I see that a lot now. I heard you say uh, trust IBM. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, I do have a sound effect for that, but yeah, but. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a trombone it's just it's a, it's called a slide whistle but it, it seems to work pretty well doesn't it um so the positive side of prefetch is it makes the worst case much better it's uh, uh in the old days it was very slow and costly back costly so it, it's gotten uh, it's getting better and better the negative side of prefetch is that it still means that a lot of io needs to be done as calculated by the db2 optimizer uh, when it's doing the access path computations. It reduces the wait time, but a lot of data is scanned, and uh, sub-second response is unlikely. And that's why you're basically here in this presentation. We know that. So the, so the methods we have for improving buffer pool tuning is arguably always increase the size of the buffer pool. That's great until your uh, AIX or your other system admin comes by and says you can't have any more memory. Always check with them prior to uh, allocating memory to DB2. If you don't, they will get even, and you will not like it. Uh, in LUW, memory is um, sized much larger than it was on, on uh, ZOS, uh, and uh, memory can be, be, uh, can be deployed in uh, such that its benefit is greatly reduced if we don't use, do it correctly. So first thing, uh, I, uh, there's three main things I talk about when it comes to separating by type of I.O., separating indexes from tables, and separating by volume. Um, some people like to have high volume indexes, uh, for example, separated from other indexes. Some people like to have tables separated from, from, from indexes. Um, but the thing that helps the most, I find with my customers, is by separating by type of I.O. Uh, on the mainframe, uh, based on the uh, various percentage thresholds that they use. Uh, this, is evol it, this evolved into a, an industry that started in, in the early 1990s where people would use tools for buffer pool. And uh, the, these tools would go out and, and look and make recommendations on, on uh, sizing buffer pools and, and object placement because you had to go down to a very low level to find out what, what was really going on with a, uh, an object and put it in the right place. We have an easier solution at DB2 LEW, and I'll, I'll talk about that as we go through these slides now. And, and uh, uh, buffer pool tuning, this is religion for tuning guys like you and I. And, and there's that's a, right. There's a kind of a fourth point that if you go back to that previous slide, yeah. there's something else I've been looking at lately. Is that mm -hmm. People have multiple buffer pools. I want to know. What is the percentage of memory allocation across the buffer pools? And also, what is the percentage of get pages or logical reads happening in each buffer pool? And then I yeah. look to make sure that there's a correlation between a high percentage of activity and a high percentage of memory allocation. Many times I've seen, you know, here's an 8 megabyte buffer pool where 90% of the logical read activity is happening, and then there's a 256 uh, megabyte buffer pool over here, and there's only 10% of the activity. So, you know, try to put, allocate the memory to where the activity is. So right. if you have correlation there, that's, that's also an important uh, item number four for your slide. Yes, I, but the other point I was going to make as I go through this, Scott, is that I uh, got into doing quite a bit of SAP tuning. And SAP uh, is this dark, uh, a very large application. I mean, there's 73,000 tables. And I started working with PeopleSoft, and it had 2,500 tables. The uh, country expert uh, up here in Canada, we asked him what, what tables you're used and which ones are not used so we can get rid of some of these things and, and save some space or at least space in our, our definitions. And the guy says, nobody knows for sure what table is used on any given day because there's temporary tables that are defined permanently that are only used for temporarily for processes. So you can't get rid of anything. So now we've got 73,000 tables. And the answer from SAP on um, the number of buffer pools they want for their application is one. 
one for everything. One, oh. one for, and and you know, on the whole, and I'll take you through where, where I'm going with this. We we uh, with various illustrations. We'll talk about that, and uh, I, I'm I'm open to a to a lively discussion on this as well. Uh, but it's it's something I, I've kind of found. Uh, here's our uh, groups of pages can be read from this. For random I/O pages will fill the buffer. The least recently used algorithm gets rid of the oldest unlocked pages and makes those available for other things, for other data. A bigger buffer pool means more pages in the buffer, which increases your hit ratio, which makes life good. So random I/O loves a big buffer pool. And here I'm going to, uh, I've got some, uh, I've got some animation here. Hopefully this is uh, flowing through on everybody's machine. Those are all green and good buffer pools. It's and, uh, it's beautiful. I love the animation. Yeah, and and then we got some updated. Yeah, yeah, jingle, jingle all the way. Yeah. So, so there we are. We we've got some nice things going on, and uh, you know, it, it, uh, as the old Bing Crosby song, accentuate the positive. Random I.O. is a positive thing, means indexes are being used, the high use pages are left in the buffer pool, and the buffer pool, the more the more memory you can give to the buffer pool, up to, you know, uh, uh, hopefully what I'd call obvious limits, the amount of memory you have, or the amount of memory needed, um, knowing your memory size is important, but the more, uh, the larger the buffer pool, the better the hit ratio, and life is gonna be better. Up, I, up saw, I, I suffer from memory leaks. <laughs> oh my goodness! Don't they make don't they make something for that called Depends or something like that? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a different kind of leak. Okay. <laughs> uh, we are getting into the uh, eggnog today. Or the, uh, too much coffee. One of the two. We uh, uh, on the other side accentuate the positive. The song continues to say, eliminate the negative which we want to maximize the residence, residency for high-use pages, so we want to remove objects or I.O. that negatively impact the page residency. A couple of things we can do is separate random for, from sequential I.O. or separate the objects that negatively impact page residency. Uh, if I separate indexes from tables, indexes are considered to be more highly used and they're smaller. That's why I separate indexes from tables. But uh, we can also look at separating sequential from random I.O. And this was the uh, big thing that they did with the uh, tuning products on COS. Uh, sequential I.O. involves reading a large number of pages to find data that qualifies, and it pushes the pages that you wanted in the buffer pool out. So in the past, we separated these things for random and sequentially uh, accessed objects. But something came out in DB2, and I, I'm con convinced that this accidentally happened, but I've started using it to a point where IBM has taken notice on several occasions, and they keep convincing me I'm wrong, and I keep telling them it's an IO access problem, and please leave block-based buffers alone. But let's have a look now. We've got uh, the effect of sequential IO on a buffer pool, and I've got my animation, I've got my little uh, uh, thing going on there at the bottom saying synchronous IO is good, asynchronous IO is bad, and we have updated pages. So let's let's uh, start start the, the ball rolling here. We'll put in our nice green green good synchronous I/O pages. Our buffer pool is looking good, and it fills up quickly. Yeah, there we go. There we go. And we're going to add in some updated pages like we had before. Beautiful. And, and now the next thing though that makes this kind of bad or different is. Oh no, those are my nice green pages. What are you nasty red things doing? This is like having a stop sign. All the stoplights in my neighborhood go red at the same time or in, in the proper time, uh, improper time when I'm trying to drive. I'm unhappy. Oh man, am I unhappy. Then this is what's happened with a, a typical buffer pool because you're overlaying data that would otherwise be good and left in the buffer pool for the next use. You're overlaying it with these huge IOs to support uh, prefetch, and that's where people say, "I hate prefetch, and my life is terrible." And uh, which means now I have to reread pages that were overlaid, and and that's where my problem comes in. So, with the idea of a block-based buffer, um, this, this is basically saying, "Let me take part of my buffer pool and make it for sequential I/O." 
and here's the specifications on doing that. For some uh, reason of misunderstanding, somebody said, don't make your block-based buffer pool any larger than 98% of the buffer pool pages as written in the IBM manual. The reality is I want my block-based area to be between one and 3% normally of the size of my overall buffer pool. I said a block size, this equals my extent size. For SAP, they use an extent size of two and they use a page size of 16. They're SAP, they like it like that. They like it like that. That's a song like that, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So here we have an, a block-based area lying down here. This is gonna take our red things. So what happens that this is one to 3% of my buffer pool. When I do my reads, I've got these nice green reads coming in and they're doing what they did before. Life is good, yep, yep. Jingle all the way and they fill up quickly as we go along and there's my updates. Now what? Now let's see, we'll get a few more updates. But now we're starting to see the, uh, we're starting to see these other uh, uh, sequential IOs come along and look where they're going. They're going into a different area. They can continue on and they're leaving 98% roughly of my buffer pool alone and they all go into this area. What is the chance of needing a, a page from a, a page written into the block area? Extremely low and I can uh, efficiently do all of the sequential IO I want. It's in one small area. Matter of fact, the way it is, it's drawn, it looks like it's 10%, but it's really one to 3% of a large pool is enough. If I've got uh, a million pages in a buffer pool and I allocate 10,000 pages, that's typically enough. That's, a, that's about 1% right there. This is your best illustration ever of block-based buffer pools. And I you think know, it, I, it deserves some emphasis. Wow! Oh, thanks. That's great. But that gives you the idea of how things work. And when people talk to, talk to me, uh, well, the, the code, it doesn't require this. This has nothing to do with code. This is to do with data distribution and IO access. It says nothing to do with how, how well IBM has written their code. I know their code is marvelous. This is how the data works. And, and this, this is, I've, uh, I've had long discussions with them on this, and I think this diagram finally made the point. I hope anyway. So the, uh, what we're doing here is rethinking the con uh, conventional wisdom of separating things, random, uh, separate random and sequentially accessed objects. They said random access mostly, sequentially accessed most, mostly. They go through all of these calculations. You buy products, you spend a lot of money. If I set up a block-based area, it automatically does it based on the type of IO. I don't have to give it any further thought. And this is one of the, the reasons is my final point down here is a single block-based buffer pool often provides reasonable or better than reasonable performance. Excellent performance would be another way of saying that. Now, as I've, I've criticized uh, uh, DB21Z for this, I've shown you how to get around it on LUW. One of the things that's really interesting to think about is that Informix, which is another IBM database, uh, has an area called a light scan buffer where they basically and automatically under the covers, if you do a, a, a random IO, it goes into your buffer area. If you go, if you do a sequential IO, like a prefetch, it automatically, and you can't stop it, it goes into another area called a light scan buffer. So we have uh, DB2LUW where you can set it up, to work like Informix. And Informix doesn't give you the choice, and Informix is a great database. Or you can try to do what the people on uh, DB2 on Z, when a lot of us came from there, and they worry about an awful lot of things where you don't really have to worry about it. I hope that makes sense. Here's some calculations just to show you what I see. I, I love when I go into a customer and I've, uh, the vector IOs are the uh, pay, uh, the sequential IOs in the page area, and you can have that be non-zero. Some cases I've actually had those be, uh, often I see those as zero or very low numbers, but I'm looking at the efficiency of the block-based area. What I'm looking for is an efficiency of about 90% of the uh, sequential IOs in the block area, and the percent of pages uh, for from the block IO and the uh, against the number of total number of uh, 
asynchronous uh, data read and index requests is, in this case, 97%, 90, nearly 98%. That's a, a fairly healthy, good use of the block area, which means I'm getting a higher page residency and I'm getting a higher hit ratio on my random IOs. So that's basically I've laid what I just said out for you again. I'll skip over that quickly because I don't want to repeat, repeat, repeat myself. I just want to talk about a few other design options here. Uh, one of these is uh, looking at multidimensional clustering and insert time clustering tables. Uh, similar technology, it's basically uh, insert ITC is an expansion of MDC. And uh, you create the uh, MDC by organized by names of columns. ITC is organized by insert time. And uh, that's another option if you want to take advantage of prefetch because you're your key ranges are going to be in various cells within your table, and it's very quickly uh, you can go in there. There's no need to reorg uh, uh, an MDC table. It's very easy to uh, to roll out data uh, doing a batch delete because you're essentially only deleting certain blocks of data. Uh, uh, wonderful things in the correct application, MDCs and ITCs are very much your friend. There's a little picture of that. Uh, we've seen this forever. I believe this was presented by Leslie Cranston for the first time in Lisbon, I dug Lisbon in 2002. So it's been around a long time, but it's uh, always looking for that right thing. The main thing with MDCs is don't make things too granular because it does IO at an extent level. Meaning if I've got an extent of 64 or uh, 32 pages, for example, if I use something like a timestamp, I'll end up with one row per 32 pages. It'll fill in your disk drives very quickly. Most people make that mistake in their first testing and learn not to do it. So keep your cardinalities low to make sure your cells are completely full. All right, let's get on and talk about the highlight of the whole presentation. Uh, we're going to think about non-clustered indexes versus prefetch, and we're going to uh, Say so prefetch can read 32 pages in one I.O. And therefore, we're reading all of these pages with a large block buffer pool and table compression. How many rows are read in a single prefetch operation? And what's the minimum cardinality for a non-clustered index to be useful? Well, here's an example here. Let's say I got a 150 million row table on 2 million pages. I've got 75 rows per page. Uh, you can. Uh, think that might even be lower in terms of the number of pages and uh, a greater number of rows per page if I compress that a little more. The prefetch is to read an entire table on 2 million pages using a prefetch size of 64. is 31,250 prefetch operations. Or per prefetch operation, I'm getting 4,800 rows. So if the, if the data is completely unclustered and assuming a uniform distribution, the index cardinality has to be 4,800 or higher to be able to be better than prefetch. See, I want to be able to read a row, uh, um, not one for every prefetch operation. I want it to be able to skip a number of those prefetch operations for my index to be better. So hypothetically, I would like my, uh, my cardinality in this case to be about 50,000 or more, which meant means that a qualifying row only appears one out of every 640, page, uh, 640 pages, if, that, if, uh, if that's clear enough. So I need high enough cardinalities because prefetch is really a great way of bringing back a lot of data. So let's, let's find a way to uh, be better than prefetch by having decent cardinalities on our table to make that work. That's some impressive mathematics, Martin. We've got just a couple minutes left. Yep, and uh, other factors that people can look at are, uh, here's an incomplete list. People could add more, uh, but here's the, the uh, uh, if I have SSDs and fast disks, I have faster physical I.O., but I still require CPU to issue the I.O., and it favors prefetch and I.O., I need higher cardinalities indexes to make that better. Data compression, data compression is lovely. It will save you CPU as well as uh, memory, as well as IO times, because you're getting more rows in in a given operation. 
again, you'll need higher cardinality indexes if you've prefetched or if you have data compression going on. Database configuration parameters and sort heap and other memory, memory things also help. You could probably add to this list as well as other things. And each one of these topics is another uh, topic that we could have on the DB2 Night Show or at a night -night presentation. Some factors are good at masking a bigger problem. Um, I can, for example, make things go faster if I get new faster disks, but if I still have a large amount of physical or, or logical I.O. going on in my application, I need to go back and look at the indexes to make, make sure they're good. So in summary, table prefetch can uh, cost much less than poorly designed indexes, and uh, prefetch is often cheap. Uh, I'm saying that again. Uh, Good indexes are the better solution, so fix your indexes and add a block-based area to your buffer pool. I'd like to say one final comment on block-based areas. Uh, they asked a question uh, about six, six or seven years ago in an IDUG in Europe, and they said, how many people are using a block-based buffer pool? And they, it was a, uh, a DB2 LUW tuning SIG. And a lot of people put their hands up, and the guys says, uh, to which the, one of the uh, uh, coordinators of the SIG said, why are you using that? And it turned out that 66% of the people in that SIG, or two thirds of them, uh, said the reason we're using a block based area is Martin told us to. <laughs> That's great. That's, That's great. And every now and then a message. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> and with that, I, I'm, I'm done. Because, because Martin said so. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yes. I am done like dinner. I'm ready for some turkey. Okay. So it's time to uh, wrap up. Poll questions. Here's the fun stuff. Next poll question. How many pictures of Santa have you seen during today's presentation? Wow. I might have a little leftover budget in my marketing budget, and I might send out some gift cards if you get the answer correct. If you don't want a gift card, the incorrect answer, one of them, is three. So choose three if you don't want a gift card. More specifically, it says how many times have you seen Santa? I'm asking how many slides contained a picture of Santa. So we have, uh, we have people are now rending their opinion on this. This is pretty good, Martin. Pe some people were paying attention today. This is oh, good. good. This is lovely. lovely. Going once, going twice, closing the poll, sharing the results. And the most popular answer coming in at 32% is six. And six is correct. So congratulations Whoa. if you responded. Congratulations to those people. That's six, awesome. Six different Santa Clauses. Yeah, that was that was a lot of fun. Okay. Yeah. And hide that. And last question. Did you learn anything today? As we always ask this question on our shows. Did you learn anything today? Oh, I think I see a question in the question queue. Oh, okay. Go ahead and have a look at that, Martin, while I run this poll. Sure. Going once, going twice, closing the poll, sharing the results. Winner, winner. Oh, those questions were only relating to uh, uh, something that I was making noise with my uh, cord or something. Uh, oh, I see. Well, speaking. All right. So and somebody wants to know about uh, MDCs on DB2 uh, on Z and uh, not happening uh, uh, for some reason that I remember an architect of DB2 thinking it was a boutique solution. I would only say wrong. It works awesome and because people have to uh, uh, understand a little more than make some uh, uh, quick dismissals of things. MDCs is, is a marvelous technology. Yes, it is. All right. One more ho, ho, ho. Yeah. ho, ho, ho. 
and we'll get the Jingle Bells music on, and we'll thank all of our attendees for being with us today. Love to see you all in the audience, and thank you, Martin, for your most excellent presentation in which 100% Thanks. of our audience learned something. Really, really good talk that you gave today. And there we go. And that's a wrap for uh, 2018. Happy New Year. It's time to go drink Merry some Christmas. Eggnog. Merry Christmas. Happy Hanukkah. <laughs> Too much coffee, spiked coffee. <laughs> All right, that's sure. it. Everybody have a good one. We'll see you again next year. Bye bye. bye.